It is good to sing and to worship together. I appreciate Anton, you telling us and reminding us that worship is not just the few songs we sing once a week when we gather. It's offering our whole lives back to God. Hopefully as you came in, you received both the communion elements, because we'll close the service with that, and one of these cards that says, is it I? If not, make sure that you uh, uh, let, your, let the ushers know and we can make sure you have that. You'll need that as we close the service. Um, you know, I'm very grateful every time I come together in worship. Particularly grateful that Ricky is back singing with us and helping lead us in worship. Yes, thank you, Ricky. You may not know this, but Ricky is a new mommy, has a baby girl, Kemma, and Anton's a new daddy, and Paige is a relatively new mommy with Ben. We're like exploding with church growth the old-fashioned way around here. A bunch of, a bunch of girls being born, and, but, but Pastor Joe Scavato, they do have a little boy, so he's, he's balancing things out, so it's exciting to see. Uh, the growth, and we're very grateful for Ricky back leading with us. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Father God, we come to you now, and we, we say we're here to worship. But if we're honest, we're distracted sometimes, and we're, our minds are on other things. The events of the past week or the coming week, or weighed down with concerns. So clear our minds and our hearts, and speak to us through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This past week, I sat down with a man who's relatively new to our church for a cup of coffee. We're getting to know each other. And I said, well, tell me your story. And he said, which one? I thought, that's a, that's a great response, you know? And he, I thought about that a number, number of times. We laughed about it. He said, there's lots of stories that make me who I am. And he's right. We are the product of different stories, right? You're, I'm going to guess in your family of origin, there were stories that were always told about, you know, oh, yeah, I've heard this one before. Mom, yes, the story, right? My, my wife would always tell our kids on their birthday morning, wake them up and tell them the story of their birth. Not all the details, but you know, the, the nice children's version of their birth, right? And you, know, you stop doing that when they're like 16 because it gets weird. But um, she would always do that. My mom tells me the story of my birth. It was, it was 1970, and on January 6th, it was 13 below zero and our car wouldn't start. And we, the, my dad was in dental school and one of their good friends drove them to the hospital. I spent the first, my first bassinet was the top dresser drawer pulled out with my, uh, you know, a, a piece of wood my dad cut to, cut to length to prop up the edge of the drawer and put me in the drawer. They didn't have any, any bassinet. So and I turned out okay, anyway. We tell these stories, right? We tell these stories because they're part of what makes us us. And some of our stories are funny and joyful, but some of us have some stories that aren't such. They, they aren't that way. They're a little more tragic and painful. But they still make us who we are. We are the product of our stories. And so when you ask someone, what's your story? It's a pretty significant question. Some of our stories are full of joy and some of our stories are full of sorrow, some hope, some regret. You've got your stories and I've got mine. But when we come together as God's people, we're, we're entering into what makes us his children and it's our story. Connecting our story, our individual stories of pain and regret and joy and hope with his great story. That's at the heart of what we're gonna talk about this morning. To be a Christian is to say, Jesus is my story. Yes, I've got dysfunction and pain and great success and joy and all kinds of different things in my family of origin and in my own personal choices. And there are lots of stories that comprise who I am. But I identify with one great grand story, the story of Jesus. Which, by the way, is why we're in the series we're in called Following the King in the Gospel of Mark. Studying deeply the story of Jesus because it's our story as well. He's the author of our story. We find our identity in him and the story he's writing. This is what we've been doing. It's why we spend the better part of a year in the Gospel of Mark. And if you're just jumping in, if you're new online or in person, we've been in this, this story of Jesus called Following the King, Mark's Gospel, way back at the beginning in September. It'll take us right up to Easter. The part of the story we're gonna dig into the, together today is probably familiar to most of you. It's the story of the Last Supper. At least, it's the cliff notes, the, curse, the surface levels version of it you're going to know or think you know. What's fascinating is that the meal itself that Jesus shared with his disciples, which we call communion or the Last Supper, was the Jewish Passover meal. Many of you know that. And that meal was designed to celebrate and commemorate the great grand story of God's people, the children of Israel. The reason they celebrated Passover every year was to tell the story. 
and to remind themselves this is who we are. We're God's ch children. We're God's chosen ones. He delivered us. Luke's gospel tells us that Jesus said to his disciples, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you, this last supper. Not just because it's the last one, because of what he would say and do in the midst of it at that last supper that he shared with his disciples that we still celebrate today. Okay, first, let's set the context here. The final days of Jesus' earthly life. We've been looking at that, Matthew chapter 13 and early in 14. Last week we looked at the, the anointing of Jesus at Bethany, this woman named Mary who comes and pours out the best of what she have, an alabaster jar of, of, of pure nard, expensive ointment, all over Jesus to anoint him before his burial, meaning everything is proceeding according to God's plan. Even though if you're in the midst of living those events, it feels a little chaotic and confusing. God is orchestrating these things. And right after that meal, we read this in Mark chapter 14, verses 10 through 11. Then Judas Iscariot, who's one of the 12, don't miss that. He was one of the 12, the inner ring, the close disciples of Jesus. Went to the chief priest in order to betray him. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. So the anointing at Bethany, right afterwards, one of Jesus' closest friends goes to the chief priests and agrees, they arrange a deal. He agrees to betray his master, his rabbi, his teacher, his Lord, for a sum of money. And so then he's looking for the right moment to hand him over. Meaning Jesus was in the temple courts in front of all the people every day, but the chief priests and the religious leaders were nervous about arresting him there because there'd be an uproar. They, they hailed him as king. Remember the triumphal entry? This is the Messiah. This is the one. If we arrest him in broad daylight in front of the crowds, it will go bad for us. So let's, let's get one of the insiders to hand him over on a private secret moment. So Judas is looking for the right time. That's important to keep in mind. But even this, is proceeding according to God's plan. Lots of debate about Judas' motives. Was he motivated by greed? Matthew tells us that, John tells us that. Was he disillusioned as a follower, thinking this, this is not the Messiah I thought he was, this is not the king I thought he was, and was he frustrated? Was he trying to force Jesus' hand? There are lots of different opinions. Whatever the case, God is using his sinful motivations to bring about his God's divine purposes. Which does not, by the way, exempt Judas from the moral responsibility of what he did. God can be sovereign over all things, even our sinful decisions, and we still are accountable for our actions. Genesis chapter 50, Joseph, and his, when his brothers, he's, he's restoring them and forgiving them, and he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Still makes it evil. Doesn't mean it's okay to betray your brother or your master or your Lord. God's sovereignty does not negate our responsibility before him. All right, let's look at the next passage, verses 12 through 16. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples sent out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. Everything is prepared. From the triumphal entry, to the anointing of Bethany, to the specific room, to the meal itself, to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the betrayal and arrest and crucifixion, it's all prepared. So I've thought about this, this upper room story. The disciples rightly say, hey, it's, it's almost time, and the meal takes time to prepare. Passover is a kind of a big deal, where are we going to do this? And Jesus tells them this sort of like this cryptic sign there to look for. And I have always read that in the past, like it's like supernatural preparation. 
You know, he's God. He can come do what he wants. You must have a room for me. And, uh, like, the, like there's some Jedi mind trick. He makes everybody like do what he wants and it's like um, his omniscience and omnipotence. Maybe. But perhaps it's just Jesus preparing ahead of time. Think about it in these terms. He knows Judas is going to betray him. He knows that must happen. He's going to say so. But he also knows that sh must not happen before he eats this final Passover meal with his disciples. Judas is looking for the right time. What better time than a private meal? What better time to betray him when there aren't crowds around than a private meal? But Jesus has not told the disciples where and when. He's kept that private. It's, it's entirely likely that he's arranged this ahead of time. Even the sign, you're gonna find a man carrying a jar of water, which you might think, yeah, what, like a guy carrying a water bottle? No, jars of water, that was what women did in the first century. This would be a very unusual sight. Perhaps Jesus has already, just on a human level, arranged the sign. And he only sends two of them. So the, the other 10 don't know where it's gonna be. I think Jesus is just saying, this meal is so important. Nothing must interrupt it. We must have this meal together before I'm betrayed. And he's making sure that the betrayal will happen afterwards. Afterwards, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is where he is betrayed, and that was his regular practice. So it makes sense that Judas would choose that moment and not before. He's kept the location quiet. The point is, what comes next in this meal is so important to Jesus and it ought to be important to us. There's so much going on here. When you, you know, when you read the Bible, I, I don't know if you're like this, but sometimes, do you ever read the Bible and just kind of read over it and go, I don't have any idea what that meant? Anybody? Would you surprise you that pastors do that too? I do that as well. <laughs> what? You know, I don't know what that means, right? And sometimes we, we do cursory readings, you know, and I think the Bible is so full of meaning. It's like a sponge soaked with water. We're just holding it, you're gonna get drips that come out. But if you squeeze it, it gushes out. So we're going to try to squeeze this story for all it's worth this morning. But there will be more. We might get all that God has for us. Let's look at verses 17 through 21, the story of the, of the supper here. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you. Now just pause there. Lots of times Jesus says, truly, truly, or in the old King James, verily, verily, right? I say to you. What's, that sounds like, like weird Bible talk. It's like he's saying, in our terms, you can count on this. Like he's saying amen, which means may it be so, ahead of time. This is true. You can count on this. He's speaking authoritatively. And he says this a bunch of times throughout this meal. We'll look at them. Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and say to him one after, the, after another, is it I? He said to them, it is the one, one of the 12, one who is dipping bread in the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he'd not been born. Yikes. Jesus knows exactly what's going on. Judas has agreed to betray him. I've, I've, I've wondered this. Why did he feel the need to tell the rest of the, two, the, the 11 disciples about this? He knows who it is. In, in John's gospel, he'll say to Judas, friend, do what you've, kept, you've come for. What you must do, do quickly, he says in Matthew's gospel. He knows what's coming. Why does he tell the rest of them? And why so cryptic? If he wants to uh, talk about it, why not just say to the other 11, this guy's a traitor? Like, why doesn't he just out him in front of all of them? Why this language about it's the one who dips the bread? And you might think, well, like, was, he, was he like saying, it is the one who dips the bread, like he's doing it right to Judas? And by the way, that's how they ate, the common meal, dipping bread in a common pot. They were all doing dipping. He's saying it's one of my closest friends is what he's saying. And they're all going, wait, wait, whoa, what? They were sorrowful, full of grief and distress, it means. Imagine that. You've given your life to this guy to follow him. For three years, night and day, you're with him. Now you're having this meal. And, and, the, and it feels like the world's coming apart. And he says, one of you will betray me. They look around and they look inward. 
And that's, by the way, is the meaning of the card you received and you walked in. I want you to make sure you have a hold of this. We'll come back to this. Is it I? They ask the question, me? Surely not me. Do you mean me? They're asking Jesus and they're asking themselves. Is it me? Is it I? I, I think I've thought about this a lot this week. Jesus, cho Jesus chose those 12 men to be his closest followers, knowing one of them would do him in. In Middle Eastern culture, to eat a meal with somebody and then to betray them was like the worst form of treachery. Because to share a meal, to sit at a table with somebody was symbolically saying, we're together. I'm with you. I share my table with you. And then to go betray him was the worst possible form of treachery. We're told that Judas betrayed him with a kiss, which would have been a kiss on his hand, which was the symbol of a disciple to a rabbi. Yet Jesus chose him. One who would betray him. One would deny him three times. All would desert him. Like the, of the 12, nobody's innocent here. One is the historical betrayer, and that's God's part of God's plan. One would deny him three times, Peter. All of them, Jesus says, will fall away and desert him when he needs them most. I think one of the best arguments for a good and loving God is that he allows people to betray him. He allows people to deny him. He allows people like me to desert him, to turn my back on him and you. He does it here and he's still doing it, by the way. He invites people to his table knowing they won't measure up. They won't be faithful. Why didn't Jesus choose 12 better men? Why did he pick 12 guys who knew he knew these? I can count on these guys. Why not? Do you know why? There aren't 12 better men or women. That's all he has to choose from is screw-ups and broken people. Present company included. That's it. That's all. That's the raw material that Jesus has to work with. Is sinful, broken, unfaithful, unable to keep our promise. Perhaps the most compelling case for a gracious and loving God is that he chooses people knowing they will desert him. They will fail. In verse 21, it, it, was, it seems clear that Jesus, that Judas, that is, did not seek and, and, and he says it's better for you not to have been born, which sounds, yeah. It seems fairly clear that Judas, unlike Peter, did not seek repentance and grace and humble himself before Jesus after his failure. Verse 21 blends God's sovereignty and our responsibility. The Son of Man is betrayed as it's, he, he, the, the Son of Man is betrayed as he must go as it's written about him. This is according to God's plan. I'm being betrayed, and that's part of God's plan. But you are the betrayer, and you're accountable for that. That doesn't make sense to us, but they go together. God is sovereign and can use even the worst moments if we turn to him. I want you to hear this before we move on. Regardless of your past, no matter the depth of your regret, and I've got mine, I know you've got yours. Nobody's beyond the grace of Jesus if we turn to him. Judas just didn't. Peter did. And therefore, if you have turned to him and you have received his grace and forgiveness, then you should rejoice in the day you were born because you know that what lies ahead of you is far better than anything that's behind you. In Christ, your past is forgiven and redeemed. Your present makes sense, and your future is secure. So the day of your birth is a joyous occasion. That wasn't the case for Judas. That's all Jesus is saying here. Let's look at verses 22 to 26. Just five verses now that, or, or excuse me, Psalm 41, 9. Uh, this is Jesus talking about his betrayal. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. 
Now turn to Psalm 41, or, uh, excuse me, Mark 14, verses 22 to 26. This is just five verses about the Passover, and Mark uses an economy of words. He doesn't, he, you, would, you would have liked Mark. If Mark was your pastor, he's really brief. I'm sorry you didn't get Mark this morning, right? He's like, he's like, it's just short and tight and to the point, right? But five verses about this remarkable meal. And as they were eating, he took bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. He took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Just five verses packed with significance for us. All right, back it up a bit. It would be nearly impossible to overstate the significance of the Passover meal to the Jewish identity, then and now. The Passover was the celebration and commemoration of the central story of what it meant to be Jewish, an Israelite. Meaning it's the story that celebrated their exodus. They were slaves under Pharaoh in Egypt, under his thumb, under the lash, oppressed. God delivered them out of their bondage, out of slavery, set them free, brought them into a new land, established them as his people. And he did so by the symbolic sacrifice of the Passover lamb. Every house that was under the blood of the lamb was passed over by the angel of death. In, in Exodus 12, God says, this is the, the celebration, this is the feast you're to have every year. I don't want you to forget who you are. So this story is your identity, right? We talked about the stories that, make, that shape us. This is their story. We're the people who were slaves and God delivered us. We've been set free because of our God. And they would eat the meal, and the whole meal was designed to tell the story. In fact, there's even questions you're supposed to ask about why we do this, mom and dad. And then glad you asked, son or daughter. I'll tell you why. And they tell the story every year. And these men, these 12, and Jesus had eaten this meal every year of their lives. In Exodus chapter six, verses six through seven, reads this. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from slavery to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. With great acts of judgment, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. I will bring you out, I will deliver you, I will redeem you, I will take you to be mine. Those four statements of God saying become the four cups of wine during the Passover meal. I will bring you out, that's the cup of sanctification. I will deliver you, the cup of deliverance. I'll redeem you, redemption, and I, you'll be my people, the cup of praise. And they would, throughout the meal, take these cups, read these passages. This is all familiar to them. So when the disciples say, hey, where are we gonna have the Passover, Jesus? They're thinking, we're gonna do the thing we always do every year. They have no idea what's coming. Jesus changed the meaning of these elements. We're so used to it. This is my body, this is my blood, blah, 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 yada, 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 we do this once a month. It would have been just so shocking to those 12. In verse 22 he says, he took bread and he broke it and blessed it. When he blessed it, he's not doing a magic trick. He's not like hocus pocus over the bread, changing the bread. It simply means he's acknowledging the God who gives us the bread of life. Blessed are you, O Lord God, King of the world, who gives us bread from the earth. The typical Jewish blessing. I read a book recently by a man named Glenn Packiam. He's a pastor in Colorado Springs. The book is called Blessed, Broken, Given, which is these statements, right? Jesus took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. It's a great read about what the Lord's Supper really means and how it shapes us as his people. And Jesus didn't talk about the bread of affliction or the bread made in haste, the unleavened bread. This was the Passover story, right? They didn't have time for the dough to rise, so they made the bread without leaven. Bre unleavened bread was the bread of their affliction. They had to wait for God's deliverance, be ready to move the moment he said so, so it was unleavened bread. That's not what Jesus said. He said, this is my body. Can you imagine being one of the 12? Uh, that's not how it goes. 
<laughs> I don't want to correct you, Jesus, but uh, that's not what they say. <laughs> I've been doing this for a few years now. What? And when he took the cup, he didn't say this is the cup of redemption or deliverance or sanctification or praise. He said, this is my blood. Uh, now it's getting weird, Jesus. What? Of the new covenant. Jesus changed not only what was said there, but also what was served there. We'll get to that. He's doing something different. He's not just changing the story like, ah, you know what, let's, let's, it's time for a new story. He's, he's showing these men how that which they had done every year was always pointing to him. How he's the completion and the fulfillment of their story. The story of deliverance. Their story of redemption. Their story of freedom. You've grown up with this story. You think it's what makes you who you are. And it's always been about me. And they were struggling to get it. And sometimes we pass right by it. Now in the Old Testament Passover, there's, there are many elements and many symbols. And if you've been part of a Seder meal or a Passover meal, you, you've, you've you know about these things. The bitter herbs, the salt water, the, the different elements of the meal and the different uh, scriptures they would read and stories they would tell and questions they would ask. But the center of the meal were three things. We've talked about two of them. The bread made in haste, unleavened bread, the, cu the four cups of wine, and the Passover lamb. I mean, that's the main course. The lamb is the whole point. It's the blood of the lamb that the angel of death passed over. It's the blood of the lamb that spared God's people under which they were delivered. The lamb is like the big deal. We gotta prepare the lamb. Do you ever notice in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in all four gospel accounts of the Passover Last Supper, what's missing from the story? It's not a trick question. I know normally you just stare at me until I tell you. Right? What's missing? The lamb. Jesus doesn't mention it. There's no record of them eating it. Scholars debate this. Whether there was no actual lamb on the table, or whether Jesus doesn't mention it, the point is, he's the lamb. There's no lamb on the table because the lamb is at the table. He's the lamb. He's saying, this lamb that you have celebrated every year and remembered how God passed over you, I am. What does John the Baptist say in the Jordan River to, about Jesus to all those watching? Behold, the lamb of God who what? takes away the sin of the world. Now Jesus at this Passover meal is, is saying without, by his silence, I'm the lamb. I'm the sacrifice under which you are truly set free. In verse 24, he says, it's the blood of my covenant. Covenant's an Old Testament word for a binding contractual promise. And the binding nature of the promise was demonstrated by the sacrifice of an animal. How would you like to do that next time you have like a contractor come to your house and like, we're going to redo our kitchen? Okay, just to make sure we both agree to this term, these terms, we're going to sacrifice a lamb in our front yard. Like, you, first of all, the police would probably be called, your neighbors would be like, this is a problem, right? But the symbol was to be like, this is serious. We won't break this, this, this covenant. We're going to hold to it. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. This is what Jesus is talking about right here. A new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke. What was wrong with the old covenant? It wasn't God's fault. It wasn't like God made a bad deal. It was ours. The problem with the old covenant is we could never keep it. And so every year, another sacrifice, another sacrifice, another sacrifice. Why? Because we keep breaking it and keep screwing up and keep messing up. We need a new covenant. In fact, that old covenant, it's not like God went, this isn't working, let's try something new. He's always bringing us to this point, to Jesus. We'll read on. Though I was... Their husband, meaning I was faithful to them, they were faithless to me, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they'll be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor, and each, you go, next slide, their, their, their brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall know me, 
For the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. The new covenant is gonna be once for all sacrifice where God remembers the sins no more. Jesus, at this, now we see why this meal matters. I have to eat this with you. I have to explain something to you. This has to happen. I have to be betrayed. I will be arrested. I'll be tortured. I'll be killed. All that has to happen. But first, we're going to eat. But first, my table. And then the Apostle Paul picks up this idea in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26. And we read these or recite these or quote parts of this every time we have communion. And maybe it just falls on you. Like, sometimes we go through the motions, right? Just so familiar, we miss it. Listen to what Paul's saying. For I received from the Lord Jesus what I delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is a key statement. Remember when I talked about our stories we tell? What's your story? Paul is saying to the early church and to us, when we take bread and cup, we're telling a story. We're proclaiming something. We're remembering his sacrificial death on the cross on our behalf. We're also proclaiming this story, which is who we are in him. He's giving instructions to us. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way before. When you come to take communion, do you ever stop and think, this is my story. This is who I am. This is who we are in Jesus. Briefly, I'm gonna walk through seven <laughs> I'll do it fast. Briefly, well, seven aspects of the power of this story. And I want you to, these will be on the screen, you can jot them down later, but I want you to remember these when you come to communion. Not just this morning, but every day following. Every time you take the Lord's Supper. Number one, the power of communion reminds us of the mystery of the incarnation. Jesus became one of us. Became like us to die for us. He took on flesh. He dwelled among us. We don't have a high priest, Hebrews tells us, that can't identify with us, but is like us in every way, with one exception. He did not sin. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to be denied. He knows what it's like to feel alone, isolated. He knows what it's like to cry out to God and wonder if he's listening. He knows what it's like to be tempted, weak, hungry, tired. Second, it centers us on the sacrificial atonement. That's theological terms for substitute. He took on flesh and became one of us to die in your place, the death you deserve. He atones for your sin. That's what it means when you hold bread and cup in your hands. Remember me, why? Oh, how nice, once upon a time, sort of the sanitized version of, like it is an example, an innocent man died. No, he died for you. You deserve the cross, and he took it. Three, it impresses on, on us the importance of personal faith. Jesus says, take, this is my body. To take it means to partake in the life that he gives. And you, you can't do that because your mom was a Christian or your grandpa was a Christian. God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has children. You must decide, I will receive what he's offering. Four, it unifies us as the body of Christ. It says, this is my body. And Paul, the New Testament, will say, we are his body. Because he sacrificed his body, he brings us together as his body. We call it communion. The center word is union. We share in the union of, in Christ. 
He's what identifies us and unifies us. He's our story. Not your political persuasions, not your socioeconomic background, not your education, not your family of origin, not where you live. Jesus. Our union is in him. Five, he, it assures us of his covenant love. How many of us, if we're honest, deep in our minds and hearts and the quietness of our souls, we wonder, could he really forgive me again for this? I mean, I know that I, technically speaking, I've heard God's love never runs out, but I'm really kind of a screw up. His covenant love means even at the table in Mark, he, those who would betray, deny, and desert him are there. And by the way, betrayers, deniers, and deserters are here too. And I'm included. Invited to his table. Because the covenant is not based on his, our commitment to him, but his commitment to us. That's what the cross means. Jesus is saying the new covenant is, I know you can't keep the rules. I have. And I will. It assures us of his covenant love. Six, it motivates us for our mission as the church. We're told in verse 24 that his blood is poured out as a new covenant for many, for the forgiveness of many. When we hold bread and cup in our hands, right? We hold these elements in our hands. You're holding a privilege which didn't come to you by your own merit, but because of grace, the gospel was preached to you, and you heard the gospel. In 1987, in Crystal Lake Central High School, um, Jim Condill, who was my FCA sponsor and wrestling coach, it preached the gospel to me, a wayward kid, lost. And I responded, not because, because God moved in my heart. I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. He just gave it to me. And so when I hold bread and cup, I'm holding the message, which is the forgiveness of the sins of the world. That's our mission as the church. Seven, it stirs in us the hope of his return. When you eat bread and cup, you're proclaiming his death, Paul says, until he returns. And he will return. It's the promise. Maybe you've never thought about that before. When you hold bread and cup, it reminds us of the mystery of who Jesus is and what he did. He became one of us. That he, he, he's died in my place, atoning for my sins. It, that I must personally respond to this act of grace and forgiveness. I'm united to all of my brothers and sisters, not just here today, but around the world in him. I'm assured of his love. I can't, it can't be broken. Romans 8, 1 says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It motivates me to mission. I have a message to share with the world. And it stirs in me the hope of his return. This life is not all there is. He will come back. All right, grab your card. This question Jesus asked, is it I? Or that the disciples asked, I should say, of Jesus, of themselves. Historically speaking, there's only one Judas. But later Jesus would say, I tell you the truth, you will all fall away. So is it me? Well, I'm not the historical Judas, but there is a denier and a deserter in me. There's a part of me that wants to run and go my own way. And that's true for you as well. And the New Testament tells us that if we're gonna take the Lord's Supper in a way that's worthy of him, appropriate, we must first have received the grace that he offers, and second, examine our own hearts so that we don't come to his table in an unworthy manner. That's what this is for. I just want you to examine your own heart. Maybe you write something down right now this morning. Maybe you answer the question, is it I? Maybe you've got something to confess. Maybe you tuck it in your Bible and you come back to that all week long. It's a question worth pondering. And here's the beauty of it. If it just stayed there, because the answer is yes, it is. It's me. But Jesus actually says, the answer to this question is, yeah, I know. But no, actually, it's me. We are all covenant breakers. He is the covenant keeper. He alone is the covenant keeper. And your place at his table is not dependent on your commitment to him. It's dependent on his commitment to you. The only way that you can receive what he offers is to answer this question and face your own weakness and recognize, yeah, that's true. I am broken. I am weak. But he is strong. 
So in this, during this next song, I just invite you, whether you sing and worship, whether you pray with your head bowed, whether you write on this card, to prepare your hearts to come to his table. Jesus' table, the great covenant keeper. Line of that song, the, the bread we eat and the cup we drink reminds us you are all we need. Jesus, you are our story. You're writing a better story in all of our lives, individually and collectively, because of your death and resurrection. Thank you for reminding us of that truth this morning through bread and cup. Now, brothers and sisters, go in the name, grace, and power of the one who is your life and your story. Jesus' name, amen.